Hey, good morning and welcome to the 945 service. Stand with us as we sing God's praises this morning. Come on. it is August. And at First United Methodist Church Plano, that means music of some of the best kind, which you have heard and will continue to hear. For this is a month of your favorite hymns, some of your favorite worship and praise music, and an August concert series. 
Tonight at 7 o'clock, we will have our own united worship band, stars of the 945 service, who will be praising God with their very best offerings to God and for all of us to sing along with. 7 o'clock tonight, you'll find that on YouTube or on Facebook Live. I'm Matt Gaston. I have the privilege of serving here at First United Methodist Church Plano, and we're glad that you are with us this morning from your church home. You'll notice a place on our website to note your attendance, give us some information so that we can connect you in ways that are life-giving. You'll also find a Give button that allows you to go online, to text, to support the ministries that are ever-expanding at this church, even in a time of pandemic. We are putting together a whole package of offerings for classes, a catalog, if you will, for going back to school uh, as adults who aren't in school. Uh, but we'll have a variety of offerings that'll be available shortly. Stay tuned for that. In the meantime, may we be those who bring our very best, who bring ourselves and invite others to do the same as we worship God with our voice, our silence, the wholeness of ourselves. We are so glad that you're with us this morning.
As I invite us to be in prayer, I'd like to invite you to think about the prayer needs that you have. If you'd like special prayer or someone to pray with you, please contact the church and we stand ready to pray with you at any time that you have a need. Would you pray with me? Dear God, we praise you and we give you thanks for your constant and abiding presence in our world, and in our lives. You comfort us in our struggles. You lead us to places that bring new life and peace. And for all of this, Lord, we give you thanks. In this great time of disorder, we lift up our school-aged children and youth and college students as they return to school. We ask your presence with their teachers and professors and their administrators. In this time of disorder, we pray for our businesses, for our workers of all kinds, for the laborers in the fields. In this time of disorder, we pray for the faithful, for our churches, 
our hospitals, all who care for our health and well being. In this time of disorder, we remember our world and our nation. We pray for those who have experienced violence, and we ask, Lord, that you would bring healing. We pray for those who have been displaced by fire or war or famine, and we pray, Lord, that you would provide for them in their time of need. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for ordering our lives again. Help us, Lord, learn from these times to grow deeper in our spirit and in our relationship with you. And Lord, as we walk in faith in these coming days, may you renew our spirits. May you help us be your light in the world. And Lord, as we live as people called as Christians, we pray that you would renew our spirits and the spirit of this earth. In the name of Christ, who is the ultimate uh, renewer of all of our lives. And now let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Cammie. I invite us in this season of kingdom tide. That's a Christian word, a church traditional word for saying how it is that the reign of Christ is being lived out in the world. That's the season we are in as Christians. And for this Sunday, we're, le- we're reading from the word of St. Paul as he writes to the house churches around Rome. We spoke on this a couple of weeks ago. We, in some sense, pick up where we left off there. This week in Romans chapter 12, beginning in the first verse, I invite us to Listen for the word of God. So, brothers and sisters, because of God's mercies, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate priestly service. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature. Because of the grace that God gave me, I can say to each one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Instead, be reasonable, since God has measured out a portion of faith to each one of you. We have many parts in one body, but the parts don't all have the same function. In the same way, though there are many of us, we're one body in Christ, and individually we belong to one another. We have different gifts that are consistent with God's grace that's been given to us. If your gift is prophecy, you should prophesy in proportion to your faith. If your gift is service, devote yourself to serving. If your gift is teaching, devote yourself to teaching. If your gift is encouragement, devote yourself to encouraging. To one giving, one should do it with no strings attached. The leader should lead with passion. The one showing mercy should be cheerful. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh, always gracious Lord, thank you for pouring yourself out for us through Jesus Christ that we might at our best pour ourselves out for others in ways that you gift us to do. May we use that gift, for it makes you happy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The title of this sermon is, Are You a Living Sacrifice? Now, I had a different title 
and then I scratched it out. The original title of this sermon was, Are You an Essential Worker? Because I thought that captured rather well the theme of what Paul was talking about in this text. But then I got to thinking about how we use that phrase, essential worker, in a time of pandemic. Remember all the way back in March, five months ago? We were pretty clear on who the essential workers were. They were the folks that were our first responders. They were the ones who were working in our hospitals and clinics. Uh, they're the ones who manage our utilities and make sure the infrastructure is working as it should. We knew who the essential workers were, but as the pandemic wore on, that definition of an essential worker began to blur a little bit. Those lowly grocery store clerks and attendants and stalkers that we never saw before suddenly became rather essential as we recognized food was still essential to our lives. And when that stock boy rolled out a pallet of toilet paper and hand sanitizer, he became an honored figure in that store. Remember? Beyond that, we really begot, we got blurred on who was an essential worker, so I just went back to a living sacrifice. Because it is a biblical phrase. It is a good phrase. It is a grounded phrase. And it is a phrase that both the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians could both glom onto. Because both groups within the church understood well what a sacrifice was. They were familiar with that notion. You may remember that a couple of weeks ago I asked the different question, are you saved? And we explored that notion from both a Jewish Christian perspective and a Gentile Christian perspective. And the two groups within the church would both answer, yes, I am saved. The Jewish Christians would say, of course I'm saved. I follow the law. I follow Torah. I observe the high holy days. I'm circumcised. I give whole grain and whole animal sacrifices to make God happy. I know I'm saved. The Gentile Christians would say, yes, I'm saved because I believe in Jesus Christ and by that faith I know I am saved. And what Paul spends most of chapter 10 and chapter 11 doing is saying to both factions within the church, yes, yes, you're both right. You are both saved by your faith. And you are both saved as you believe in a Christ who leads you to righteousness by tenets laid out in Torah, the law. Indeed, it was the law that showed us how to be our best Christians. Just look at the Ten Commandments. Are you a living sacrifice? Yes, both sides could say. And that's what leads up to this first word in chapter 12 that is so very important. For it is a demarcation, it is a transition. Various translations, it is so. Other translations, therefore. But it is a clear pivot point for the readers and the hearers. And it sounds like this. Now that he's gotten the Jewish and the Gentile Christians on the same page, we're in this together. So, or therefore, sisters and brothers, because of God's mercies, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. This is your priestly service. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature. Friends, there is so much packed into just those two verses. Who knew that what we give of ourselves is something holy? Whoever we are and whatever we offer faithfully, it is a holy offering. Who knew that what we offer, however minuscule we may think it is, when it is given faithful, it is that which makes God happy. It pleases God. 
just as surely as the Jewish Christians believed that a whole grain or a whole animal sacrifice pleased God, the aroma that rose to heaven. And who knew that no one person had to do it all. That indeed, the body would be so much stronger if each part of the body understood that it was just their part to do. That they didn't have to do it all. And that it is a priestly service that each believer is providing. Think about that. What you do is a priestly service. Now, we would normally think, well, wait a minute, I, I'm not a priest, I'm not a pastor, I might be a minister by job description, but I'm real clear that I don't do those things that a pastor or a priest does. Oh, you are wrong, parchment breath. The Bible is clear in saying that you and yours is a priestly service, no matter what. And no matter how small you may think that contribution is. Knoxville, Tennessee, August 18, 1920. The gathered session of the Tennessee legislature was in pitched debate. At issue was the 19th Amendment that would, for the first time, give the right to vote to women in the United States. 35 states had already voted yes in 1920. The amendment needed one more state legislature, leg, legislature to say yes. And Tennessee was it. The suffragettes were up in the gallery looking down on the legislators. There was immense tension in that room because all of Tennessee's southern neighbors had already said no to women having the right to vote in this country. The suffragettes knew where the votes were. There were 47 votes. They needed 49 out of 96. All eyes turned to one Harry Byrne. Harry Byrne was a wise old 24 years old. He was a brand new legislator. And the suffragettes fearfully knew what his vote was going to be, and it wasn't going to be favorable because he was wearing a pin, a pin with a red rose, which was a certain sign of his opposition to women having the right to vote. What the suffragettes did not know was that inside his vest pocket was also a letter, a letter addressed to a son by Phoebe Byrne, Harry's mother. And before the vote was called, he reached into his vest and pulled out that letter and read it again. For he had read it several times. But as he read it on the stage, as it were, he heard it differently. Dear son, hoorah, vote for suffrage. I love you, Feb your mom. I, he voted, startling everybody in the chamber. And immediately Tanker Banks right next to him said, I, and they did not expect his vote either. And the 19th Amendment passed. In the Tennessee chamber and for the United States of America and since 1920, for 100 years, women, white women, for 100 years have celebrated and sometimes taken for granted the right to vote. Phoebe Byrne, a mom, in 1920, she was a member of what is now Nicote United Methodist Church in Tennessee. Nicote, Tennessee. And indeed, the suffragette movement had begun nearly 70 years earlier in Seneca, New York, in Wesley Chapel. Sojourner Truth, a freed slave, began her ministry as an itinerant Methodist minister. Phoebe Byrne 
fell in a great tradition of being a living sacrifice, of giving a word of encouragement, as Barbara said, to a son who felt moved by the Spirit to move from injustice to justice. No, what can one person do? Just a whole transformation sometimes. Paul goes on. Verse 3. Because of the grace that God gave me, I can say that each one of you don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Instead, be reasonable, since God has measured out a portion of faith, not all the faith, but a portion of the faith to each one of you. We have many parts in one body, but the parts don't all have the same function. I think back to only just the last few weeks and months in just the life of this church. And I think of children who with Nigel's help, Robin's help, were singing a chorus of music together from their individual rooms where they were sheltered in place. I remember as our youth surprised, sometimes to the point of tears, our veterans in giving them on July 4th a plant and a flag and saying, thank you for your service. I am moved every November when I'm asked to come and bless nearly 700 skullcaps prayer shawls, quilts that are made by a group of women in this church and beyond this church before they are distributed to six to eight hospitals and women's shelters to remind them that the embrace of God is as surely upon their lives as these gifts are upon their shoulders. I, I just bow with utter respect to the men of which I want to be like when I grow up. When about 15 or 20 gather here every Friday morning at 7 o'clock, dark, light, cold, hot, they're here. And they gather lawnmowers and they grab edgers and they grab screwdrivers and they grab saws and they do anything and everything that needs to be done in this church, outside and inside. We call them the yard birds. Living sacrifices. And when I met them the first time. I said, I want to do that. And so from time to time, I'll come down on a day off and I'll go, I, I want to do this with you. And I'll say, hey, can I, can I ride that mower? And they go, no, 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 you don't, you don't get to ride the mower. Take, take an edger. And I'll say, well, how about this mower over here? And they go, mm, no, no, you, you, you take an edger over here. It might have something to do with the fact that I flipped the mower over the first time and they haven't forgotten that. I finally got used to the idea that Maybe I didn't have to ride a big boy mower. Maybe my part was just to do the edger. So now when I come, I just walk in and say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take the edger. You're all given a part, a small something to do. And this is priestly service. By virtue of our baptism, by virtue of our covenant with God, we are given this. And when we accept that with thanksgiving and we exercise that, we move from identity to mission. We, we move from belief to action. We, believe from, we move from knowledge to a working ethic to help bring about the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven in whatever way we're just given to do. Last two weeks, we've had blood drives here at the church. I don't know if you've seen the material, but in the midst of a COVID-19 and all the talk about hospitals, there's a chronic blood shortage. And so we've turned on the lights, the air conditioning, we've had personnel here to make sure that Carter Bloods Care Center, the American Red Cross, whenever they want to host and put out there to the whole region the plea for blood and the opportunity for people to be living sacrifices, they can come to First United Methodist Church of Plano. And I couldn't have been more proud when Cammie and I were here a week ago. Uh, the Carter Blood Care folks were here, and I saw Yolanda Garza, I mean Yolanda Murray, and I saw Tim Herbst, and we saw Leslie Harris. 
Uh, we saw Steve and Debbie Alt, uh, all of them coming down to literally be a living sacrifice, to give all of their blood or part of their blood so that others might live. And Debbie told the story of how she was just going to be a driver because she doesn't do that. That's what Steve does. She hates needles. Well, her friend Maureen, uh, who was always a person that would give, also came. And Debbie said, great, I'll drive. I'll drive you both down there. I'm comfortable with that. So she drove and she parked and she sat in the car waiting for them to come back out. Steve came out. He said, blood pressure's off. They won't accept my blood. And then Maureen came out. She goes, eh, I just got over shingles. They won't take my blood. And Debbie said, that's when it hit me. I'm stuck. Figuratively and literally. And so Debbie came in and she gave her blood. No, I, I think of our children. I think of our youth. I think of the women of our church, the quilters. I think of our yard birds. And I realize that, you know, I could have stuck with that original title. Are you an essential worker? Because I assure you that when you give and you give faithfully, you are an essential worker. And you make God smile because you are making a difference in this world that is personal, providential, and lasting. This is the good news. May we hear it and step into it. For God is with us. And the whole church said, Amen. There is a P.S. to that story. When Debbie came back into the chapel to give her blood, they said, you know, what we really need is plasma because plasma is what burn victims in our hospitals most need. Would you be willing to do that? It takes a little longer. You'll feel that a little differently, but would you be willing to do that? We have a burn victim in our church. And Debbie said, yes, I'll, I'll do that. And so Debbie was there longer than she ever thought she would. She gave blood when she never thought she would. And oh, by the way, Debbie Dalt had never given blood before in her life. Thank you for giving. Thank you for texting your gift. Thank you for making your gift electronic and regular for you undergird electricity and personnel that makes this church able to reach folks with the things that we offer one person at a time. Blessings.